Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everybody here with us today. My name is Dr. Suraya and in the next 45 minutes or so, I will be talking about my research with the magma laboratory at the University of Liverpool, talking about how we can model magma propagation using gelatin. And before we jump straight into that, let me first and foremost give a huge thank you to UKM first and foremost for giving me the opportunity to further my studies in Liverpool, as well as giving me this opportunity to share the results of that research with everyone today. So first of all, let's have a look at the agenda for today's talk. So we're going to start off with some introduction, a little bit of context into what modeling is like, especially in volcanology. And then we're going to have a look at how I tortured jelly for science, or the more scientific way of putting it, the characterization of gelatin as an analog material. And then we'll have a look at some experiments, some dike experiments, and there will be lasers. And if time permits, then we will discuss a few of the SIL experiments as well. So let's get to it. So starting off with the introduction and modeling in volcanology. First of all, let's have a look at some of the motivation behind studying volcanoes. So why should we be paying attention to volcanic eruption and why should we be studying volcanic processes? This is because when a volcanic eruption happens, there is a lot of societal and economic impacts associated with it. So for example, the Eyjafjallajökull Yokul eruption in 2010 resulted in a total of 100,000 flights being cancelled, which resulted in almost 7 million total passengers being stranded in airports across the globe. And the economic consequences of this eruption was that the European economy lost $1.9 billion in the first six days of the eruption. And the aviation industry lost approximately $200 million per day. So as we can see, there is an increasing need for reliable and quantitative predictions of volcanic eruptions on which we can base rational hazard and risk management decisions during volcanic crises. Studying volcanoes, however, comes with its own set of challenges. So for example, a lot of field areas for volcanologists could be really remote, so they're not easily accessible. Some field areas could be really dangerous. And a second set of challenges for most volcanologists is that a lot of the processes that they study, for example, the propagation of magma that we will be talking about today, happens below the surface. And this means that it is obscured from direct observation. So it is very difficult to study something that is happening without seeing it directly. So another thing is that these processes can also occur over a very large time scale. So some things can happen really fast within a couple of seconds, and some could take tens of thousands of years. This is where modeling comes in really handy, especially in the field of volcanology. So with modeling, we are able to test theoretical models in the lab and we can reduce accessibility issues. So remember when I told you that a lot of the processes happen below the surface where it's difficult to observe and a lot of the places are actually quite dangerous. These can be easily avoided when you are doing modeling in the lab. And with modeling, a lot of the development of the models involves very systematic and rigorous testing. And these models can be repeated and reproduced in the lab. And using this method, a lot of quantitative interpretations are possible. Modeling in volcanology is not something that is particularly new, but is something that is gaining a lot of traction and has grown in interest over the years. So here in these two graphs, these are showing some data from a web of knowledge search within geology, geochemistry, and geophysics. So Kavanaugh and Annan in 2018, they had a look at these search terms. So using the combination of the search terms you can see on the screen, you can 
compare these two graphs and have a look. So we can see, even without looking at it really closely, that we have an increase of interest in modeling in volcanology. So here we have the citations per year and also the number of papers per year that correspond to numerical and analog modeling in volcanology. We've talked about modeling a lot in the past few minutes, but we haven't had a look at any of the actual models in volcanology. So before I go on and show my experiments, let's have a look at some of the other experiments that have been carried out in the field. So there are many, many experiments that have been carried out, but these are just three examples that we've got here today. So you can study different parts of a volcano, different processes, for example, with intrusions. These are some of the examples. So intrusions going into elastically deforming crust or maybe into a brittle deforming crust. So you can see that they have different materials and different intrusion geometries. You can also study stuff like the gas slugs in a volcanic conduit. And this is over a bigger scale. So you can see here with the scaffolding, this is a massive, massive analog model that we have here. Okay, so it can take place over different scales and you can study different processes in volcanology. So before cooking, usually we will get to know our ingredients and therefore before we carry out our experiments, first of all, we need to know what materials we are working with. So in this part of the presentation, I will be talking about how I have characterized gelatin and why it is suitable to be used as an analog material. Out of all the materials, why gelatin? So gelatin is of particular interest because it is transparent. What this means is that we can see through it. And this is of interest because as I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, a lot of the processes studied by volcanologists happen below the surface where it is difficult to see up close and personal. So with a material that is transparent, such as gelatin, these processes can be observed in real time. The second property of gelatin that makes it particularly good to use as an analog material is that it is photoelastic. So transparent materials such as gelatin, glass, plastic, these materials under stress will become doubly refracting. So what this means is that a ray of light will be split into two rays at entry. So internal strains that develop within these materials can be observed using polarized light. So what you can see here in this picture, so let me just try and outline the plates on this photo. So here we have a set of plates that are attached to the experimental tank, which allows you to see these, these color fringes that form due to the stress that is produced when the intrusions are growing inside the experimental tank. Okay, so this, these are two of the main properties that make gelatin such a good material to be used in analog modeling. So going back to our analogy about cooking and knowing your ingredients, we've decided on our ingredient gelatin. So now let's talk about how we go about preparing said material for the experiments. So to prepare it, one important thing that you need to note when working with gelatin is the gelatin to water ratio. So if you have too much water, then your jelly will be really, really soft and wobbly. And then if you have more gelatin powder, then your gelatin will be stiffer. So here on the left, this is just the calculation that is used to prepare 2.0 weight percent gelatin. So you can see here that the ratio of gelatin to water, we have 800 grams of gelatin powder and 39,200 grams of water. And the preparation is pretty simple. So 
just like our chef, even in the lab, we have a lot of mixing. There are pots involved in making this gelatin. So we start off by putting the gelatin into a pot and then stirring it quickly with water and then topping it up and making sure that it is lump free. So it's very important that it has no lumps so that the gelatin is homogeneous throughout the experiments. Okay, now that we've decided on the material we want to use, let's move on to the part where we rigorously and systematically test the material. Okay, so how do we know how wobbly the jelly is or how stiff it is? So this is the method that we use to measure the stiffness of the gelatin. So we are looking particularly at the Young's modulus of the material. Okay, so to calculate this, we use an indentation experiment. So what this does is that we are introducing an indent into the gelatin by using a load of known dimensions and known mass. Okay, so first of all, we would take a measurement to the surface of the gelatin, then we would apply a load onto the surface. And then we would take a second measurement. So this is the measurement plus the thickness of the load. And then we will use this in the calculation to get our Young's modulus. So here is a look at our loads. So we have two materials here. We have the aluminum loads. Okay, so MO1, MO2, these are made of aluminum. MO3 and MO4 are made of brass. So these two here are heavier, so they will cause a bigger indent in the gelatin. These two are a little bit lighter. So the reason why we have two materials is that when the gelatin is of a lower concentration, so a lower concentration of gelatin, if you use the brass loads, then it will be too heavy and it might risk tearing the gelatin apart. So this is where the aluminum loads come into handy. And if you're, we're working with a material that is of a higher concentration, so something that is pretty stiff, then you will need something heavier to make sure that you do have that indent for us to measure the Young's modulus. Okay, so this is why we have these two different loads. So we've got the measurements, we've got the mass and also the diameter. So all of this gets plugged into the formula for us to get the Young's modulus. So now that we've had a look at the different loads that we use to measure the Young's modulus of gelatin, let's have a look at what kind of trends we get from the measurements. Okay, so before we go into the plots, let's have a look here. So your y-axis is the Young's modulus, that's E in pascals. And on your x-axis, you will see the time in hours. So here you see a similar pattern across all five graphs. So let me walk you through what is going on here. So here on the left, these are the effects of the loads on the E values. So as you can see here on the top, these top two plots, these are the ones that were taken using the aluminum loads, MO1 and MO2. These ones on the bottom, these are from the brass loads, MO3 and MO4. And if you look closely, you'll be able to see that with the aluminum loads, we have bigger error bars, and this is associated with how light the loads are, hence creating more errors. And on the bottom, you can see that we have smaller error bars because they are heavier and the indentation produced is more representative of the material. And on the right, we have a weighted plot. So this takes into account the indentation created by all four loads. And we can see here that we have this trend where it increases in stiffness over time and reaches a plateau. So this plateau here, I will tell you why this is interesting in a moment. But first, let's have a look at the early evolution of the material. So here, as you can see in the first 50 hours, so let's say in the first two days of creating a gelatin experiment, the material is still changing. So if you're doing a single layer experiment and you're running it in, on the same day, 
that is completely fine. But you need to take note that if you're running one experiment over the course of two days, that your E value on day one and your E value on day two will not be the same because of this curve right here at the beginning. So this is something to take note of, but usually when we do single layer experiments, we would measure it on the day and the experiment is carried out straight away. So this is no problem, but just in case anybody is interested in running a multi-day experiment, then I would highly recommend doing it after day two, because this is when the material stabilizes and you will have the same or very similar E values across the next few days. So looking at the plateau E values, would there be a relationship between the plateau values and the concentration of gelatin? And the simple answer is yes, and very strongly so. So looking at the plot here on the right, we can see that there is a very strong linear correlation between the concentration of gelatin and the E plateau. So here on the left, I think this illustrates it quite nicely as well. So the 2.5 weight percent value, this is from published data from Kavanaugh et al. in 2013. And then plotting on all the points from my experiments. So we can see here that the trends match up quite well and you can see that strong positive correlation one more time. Okay, so in this plot, we've removed the error bars for clarity, but you can see the relationship really, really beautifully here. Okay. So why is the plateau E value very important? This is specifically important for experiments with two layers. So here, this is a SIL experiment. So this is from Kavanaugh et al. in 20, 2006. So we have a SIL experiment here, and this is made up of two layers of gelatin. And these would typically have either two layers of the same concentration or two layers of different concentrations. So for example, if we had a three weight percent top and a 2.5 weight percent bottom, we would be able to measure the Young's modulus for the top layer because we can still apply loads to the layer. But for the layer on the bottom, how are we going to measure it? Okay. So to measure the layer on the bottom, this is where this plot comes in handy. So knowing the E plateau value and leaving the jelly long enough to set, then we will be able to know the value of E for the bottom layer. So this is where the plot comes in handy. Okay, so let's move on to the next part. So next on the list, we have rotational rheometry. So this method here, this is commonly used in a lot of different sciences like food sciences to check whether your chocolate's the right consistency, if your washing detergent is the right consistency. So this here, this is applied to my gelatin samples. So what happens is you take a small amount of the sample, you mount it on the rheometer, and then you apply a plate in a parallel setup. So here we have used the parallel plate and also the cone geometry, and this is for lower concentrations of gelatin specifically. So what happens is you put a little bit of the sample on the rheometer and then there will be oscillation. So what this means is that it will keep turning and turning and squishing the sample for a set amount of time. So in this case, we set it to run for three hours until the material breaks. Okay. And then let's have a look at what the results are from these experiments. So because of the squishing and after, ta um, after time has passed, sometimes you would hear a sound from the rheometer. And this is why uh, my colleagues used to joke that this is a jelly torture machine because you would literally hear screeching coming from the machine as the material breaks. Two things that we would have to have a look at when we're studying gelatin using a rheometer is first of all, its stability. So when does the material become stable and turns into its gel state? 
and the second is looking at its elasticity. So looking at this plot that we've got here on the bottom, so we can see here that there is a nice linear relationship between the stress and strain of the gelatin across both temperatures that we tested it on. So we have 5 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius, which are the temperatures that we usually run the experiments at. So it's very reassuring to know that this material will behave elastically within these temperatures and within the concentrations that we use to test it on. So we can confirm with high confidence that this material behaves elastically and it will undergo elastic deformation. And this is perfect for our experiments with dikes and sills because in this case, we will be modeling dikes and sills that flow into fractures that break open through a tensile elastic manner. So there are two ways, two popular ways in which intrusions would intrude into the host rock. So first of all is tensile elastic. So think about something that's unzipping and pushing open. So these intrusions would be best modeled using elastic material. The second type is the viscous indenter method. And this one, the intrusion would bulldoze through the material. So you can see shearing and shear failure, which is typically associated with intrusions of this type. So we will be modeling this type here. So tensile elastic. And for this reason, gelatin would be perfect. So now that we've gotten to know the material and we know that it has been systematically and rigorously tested, let's move on to the experiments. So in the, these experiments, we will be looking at the propagation of magma through the Earth's crust in two different geometries. So the first one being dikes and the second sills. So if you're not in from a geological background or you're not from volcanology, maybe you are unfamiliar with these terms. So let's have a look at what these are. Before we look directly at what dikes and sills are, although you may have already spotted those two here on the diagram, let's first talk a little bit about the system, the intricate system that is the volcanic and igneous plumbing system. So just as the name suggests, it is very similar to our complex plumbing system that we have in our houses. So instead of supplying water to our homes, volcanic and igneous plumbing systems supply material from within the earth and onto the surface. So it is a complex network of magma production. It is also a place for storage and it has transport channels and chambers. And these all underlie volcanic regions in all tectonic settings. So you have production, storage and transport all part of the system. So yes, very much like the plumbing system that we have at home. So we have the water tank, we have all the pipes and it supplies it to different places. That's how you can imagine the volcanic and igneous plumbing systems to be like. Now that we're acquainted with volcanic and igneous plumbing systems, let's have a look at a few of the different types that we will be discussing in today's talk. So first of all, we have dikes. So dikes are typically described as intrusions that cut across bedding layers. So these are described as being discordant and believe it or not, only approximately 10% of all dikes propagate to the surface and erupt. So for example, here in the field, we can see that this is an arrested basaltic dike. It doesn't go all the way to the surface. So this is what I mean by saying that not all dikes erupt at the surface. Here on the left, we have an example of this beautifully exposed ship rock dike in New Mexico and somewhere a little bit closer to home. So this is just to bring a little bit of nostalgia to the times that when I was an undergrad in UKM. So this is from our Pantai uh, Dimo fieldwork to Kuantan. So these are two dolerite dikes intruding into granite in Kuantan Pahang. So this is a photograph from my actual field class. So 
geology friends if you are here today hello <laughs> and this was a great field trip i do miss field work with my friends okay so ukm nostalgia aside let's move on to the next intrusion that we will have a look at today so the next one is sills and sills as opposed to dikes are concordant so that means they follow the bedding plane just like this so in the picture here what you can see as a thick black band that spans across the horizon you can see it as far as the eye can see you can still make out where the sill is this is a dolerite sill that has intruded into sandstone so hopefully it is clear enough on your screens but if you can't see it so you can see the bedding very very clearly and that the dolerite actually follows this bedding perfectly so this sandstone here this is part of the beacon supergroup so this was part of a shallow sea environment around 250 to 400 million years ago so during this time the southern continents were locked together forming the supercontinent Gondwana. So if you imagine an intrusion this big with this much material, you can also infer that any eruption from this kind of source would result in the splitting of Gondwana. So this is a very beautifully preserved dolerite sill. And yes, do check it out on Google Earth if you haven't seen it before. And another feature, just as a point of interest that you can check out here is the blood falls okay but i'll leave the exploring to you and we'll move on to the jelly experiments next before we begin planning the development of the models and how we were going to carry out the experiments it was very crucial for each of us as members of the lab to first think about what do what we were going to get out of these experiments what were the challenges that we were trying to tackle and what could we do about it so let's go back to our list from the start and here we can see that we already have some things that we could address by doing experiments in the lab so first of all a lot of the processes happen at depth so a lot of things happen below the earth's surface so one we needed visibility so we needed something that we could observe two we needed something that we could observe in real time due to the fact that a lot of the processes that happen in volcanology happen on two very different spectrum of time and both of them are not ideal to be observed directly so we needed an experiment that we could observe directly in terms of what is happening be beneath the surface as well as being able to record it in time and also in a spatial sense so the previous slide served as a compass so to speak for how our experiments would be planned moving forward but also there are already a lot of research being done on volcanoes today so this is something that we had a look at as well so let's see what kind of data we already have and what kind of ideas we can bring to the table to help to improve and constrain when and where a volcanic eruption will happen so let's have a look at this diagram here really quickly so currently we have stations collecting gas samples we have stations measuring deformation so this can be done with a tilt meter gps and also surveying we also have data that tells us about the ground vibrations in volcanic regions and we also have really excellent remote sensing capabilities so we have everything from satellite imagery to thermal imaging and also just cameras on site so we have a lot of information here so just looking at this diagram here we have a lot of information of what's going on above the surface so deformation is covered gas clouds are covered the emissions are covered but we still don't know how this relates to what is going on beneath the surface so this is a third part of what i was interested in studying in the lab 
So the idea of connecting the geometry of what's happening beneath the surface and the deformation that happens above the surface is not something that is completely new, but still needs a lot of constraining. So the subsurface movement of magma is definitely something that we can confirm to have been expressed at the surface, thanks to a lot of our excellent monitoring systems. So we have INSAR, for example. So here, what you have on the screen, you're probably wondering why there is a picture of a hat. So this here is a picture of a Mexican sombrero. And this paper here describes the uplift above this region to be a sombrero type uplift above the Altiplano Puna magnetic body. So this was put forth as proof, as evidence of a ballooning mid-crustal diapir. So diapirs typically take the shape here. So sort of like ballooning like a dome pushing up. And this was mirrored on the surface as this kind of shape. So just like a sombrero. So if we can put together the correlation between the shape that we observe on the surface, so the pattern of deformation on the surface, to the types of geometries below the surface, then this would definitely help us loads in trying to constrain the type of eruption, when it's going to happen, and so on and so forth. So as we hit the half an hour mark on the presentation, I thought I'd just slide this in. So this was something really funny on um, intrusion Twitter, so to speak, so on volcanology Twitter. So this person has put a blanket on a leather couch to protect it from her cats. Okay, so instead of the cats sitting on top of the blanket, we have a cat beneath the blanket, to which other geologists have responded saying that cats and igneous sills are related, I think. So if you remember our sills, they are that sort of shape. So you would think about it as having that kind of uplift above the intrusion. So here we have uplift detected on the surface of the blanket, but what is the associated geometry below it? So we know that it is a cat, but what shape is the cat taking? So here we've got another volcano um, volcanologist throwing some ideas, saying that here, this is a cross-section to prove that that is a lacolith and not a sill. So a lacolith, so the background sketch, that is a real sketch of a lacolith, but they've superimposed it with a cat. So lacoliths typically have more domed tops as compared to sills. So this is why they've said this is a lacolith. But yes, that is just an intermission between the slides. So now let's get back to the science. With this first setup, I am interested in looking at three things. So the first one is the surface deformation. So the way that I've done this is to shine a laser transect, which cuts perpendicularly to the dike. So here we use a, we are using a micro epsilon laser scanner, and this is controlled using the software scan control. So what happens is as the dike is growing, then we are able to capture the cumulative surface deformation as it happens. Secondly, what I was interested in is the evolution of the internal stresses. So as the dike grows, what are the stresses and how does it look like? So if you remember from my earlier slides on why I've chosen gelatin is that it is photoelastic. So here we have a set of polarizing films on the side which allow me to see these color fringes associated with the growth of the intrusion. And last but not least, I was also interested in the intrusion geometry. So how is the intrusion growing over time? So this was recorded with a second camera perpendicular to the first camera, and this was processed using the software tracker. So this is a, an open, so open source software that can be used to do some image analysis. And as I pointed out at the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned that there will be lasers, plural, 
So that was one laser in the previous setup. The second laser that was used is a new wave solo PIV3 laser, which is typically used for particle image velocimetry experiments. But in my case, I've used it for DIC. And what this is, is digital image correlation. So using a grid of known dimensions, I am able to map out where the fluorescent particles, so these shiny green dots, I'm able to map out the movement of these fluorescent particles, and this in turn will tell me the stress and strain of the material as the intrusion is growing. So this picture here, this is from a two-layered experiment. So this is why you can see that there is an interface down the middle. But yes, this is the second laser that is used in my experiments. So this is what the two lasers look like in the lab. So the first laser is used to measure the surface deformation of the gelatin, and the second laser is used to illuminate the fluorescent particles in the gelatin, which is then picked up by two specialized cameras, and this helps us to calculate the internal stresses and strains as the intrusion is growing inside the gelatin. So yes, these are the two lasers that I've used in the lab. The second laser is a very powerful laser, and in the lab, we wouldn't see this green glow. The only reason why we see this green glow is because I've taken this picture on my phone. But in the lab, when you are wearing safety goggles, so remember, safety first, when you're wearing safety goggles, you would not be able to see the laser at all, which at times was a little bit scary because there is a warning that says if you take off your goggles and the laser is on, you could potentially go blind. So yes, that's a fun story from playing with lasers. Now that we've had a look at the cool setups that we have in the lab, let's have a look at one experiment. So first of all, before we start, let me show you the different camera views that we will be looking at today. So first of all, we have the view from the top. So this is looking at the laser transect and the dark colored sand on the surface of the gelatin. The second camera view, this is looking at the geometry of the growing intrusion. And the third view is looking through polarized film. So if you remember the color fringes and the photoelasticity of the gelatin, this is the camera view that you would want to look at. So this is the one that will have all the nice color fringes. So let's see how the three of them come together. All right, so I will play the video and I'll point out some interesting things along the way. So here, right from the get-go, you see that it forms this very beautiful penny-shaped fluid-filled fracture. And on the right, in camera three, you can see that it forms this bow-tie-shaped stress field. And this carries on towards the surface and even grows bigger as it approaches the surface. And once it does breach the surface, it forms a very small fissure eruption. So just right here. Okay, so you can see that when this video was paused, you can see that it still does have that bow tie shaped stress field. And this shape here, when it was earlier a penny shaped dike, has expanded into an ellipsoid as it reached the surface. So let's have a look at some of the analysis from this experiment. So we used the footage from the two cameras that were recording the sides of the tank. So looking at the geometry and also the dike tip, we plug those into tracker. So this tells us the velocity of the intrusion as it was growing and also the dimension, so the length and the width of the intrusion were recorded as well. From the video footage, as well as the analysis carried out in Tracker, we are able to break down the growth of dikes into three key stages. So there's stage one, stage two, and stage three, based on the velocity of the dike as well as the geometry. So the geometry looks at the width of the dike, as well as the length, so how tall the dike is. So let's have a look at stage one. So in stage one, we have a 
decreasing dike length velocity. So this is the dike growing into its penny shape. So we have equal width and length. And then we have a stage of constant velocity, which allows the penny shape to grow into an even bigger penny shape. So it's still very round. And we have the same length and width during stage two, but approaching stage three. So stage three, it will accelerate towards the surface right before eruption. And you can see the split here as well in the geometry. So here, you can see that the dike begins to grow taller more than it does wide because it is chasing to work, go towards the surface to chase that eruption. So here are the three stages that we observe from the video footage and also from image analysis. That was what was going on below the surface, but what about on the surface? So are there any surface deformation patterns recorded and what does it look like and how does it correspond to the growing dike beneath the surface. So here we will be looking at a graph and this graph highlights the last 120 seconds prior to the dike eruption. So here this experiment ran for a total of eight minutes. So this is just the last 120 seconds of that experiment. So just looking at the first profile here. This is cumulative vertical displacement. So just looking at this first profile here, nothing much going on. So we can see that it is quite a late expression on the surface. So let's move it along a little bit more. We're starting to see kind of a little bit of a pattern, but nothing too prominent. And as we move along even further, as we approach the eruption point, the pattern becomes even more prominent. So here we get to see a pattern of two topographic highs flanking a region of topographic low. And this region of topographic low corresponds very well to the position of the dike tip. And talking about the position of the dike tip, we are also able to measure the tip position relative to the surface and measuring that gives us its velocity. So this, men, me, um, this matches the data that we've seen in the previous slide very well, where as it approaches the surface, it speeds up in velocity. So you can see here, right before eruption, it just goes all the way up. And this is what gives us the best deformation. So in the previous setup, we've had a look at the intrusion in terms of its geometry and also the velocities. We've also had a look at the surface deformation. But now let's move on to the second setup where we're going to have a look at how the gelatin behaves in response to the growth of the intrusion. So here we have two sets of graphs. One shows the horizontal displacement of the gelatin and the second one shows the vertical displacement of the gelatin. So just looking at these, so don't worry about the numbers, but let me just show you these patterns here. So here we have some vectors. So we have lots of tiny arrows showing the direction of movement of the fluorescent particles in the gelatin. So here you can see in stage one, as the dike is propagating, you can see these large arrows on the side, and these match up really well to that bow tie shaped stress field. And you can see that the strongest stress is focused on the tip of the dike, just like you saw in the polarized film view. And as it moves along, once it hits the eruption point, so this is on eruption, you can see, you can probably make out quite a bit, but as it erupts, you can see that the vectors start to curl in to close up the dike as it erupts. Okay, so this is one view that we didn't get from the previous experiment but using the gelatin that is seeded with fluorescent particles. So imagine all of those particles moving and being mapped. We get to see this process here where after it unzips to let the material move up, it 
zips closed the moment that it already erupted. And here in the second part, we can have a look at the vertical displacement. And this again supports that idea of having two topographic highs flanking a topographic low on the surface of the gelatin. So this is just two different views of displacement as told from the results from the experiment with the laser and the fluorescent particles. So the results in the previous slides can be summarized using this diagram right here. So I aim to look at the relationship between the intrusion geometry and the expression shown at the surface. And we can see here right off the bat that they match really, really well. So let me just break down the results one more time. So at the tips of the dike, we will have this bow tie shaped stress field that grows as it approaches the surface. And on the surface of the gelatin, we will be seeing a matching pattern of two topographic highs flanking a region of topographic low. And this region of topographic low corresponds to where the dike tip is. And it's very interesting to see that the bow tie shape matches really well to the deformation expressed on the surface. So having this matching pattern is really promising, but this is just the results from some lab experiments. How does that translate to nature? Does it match? Can we use it? The answer is yes. So this is also a pattern commonly observed using INSAR, using satellite imagery. So this is just a photograph of Kilauea. And again, we see that prominent pattern of two topographic highs flanking a topographic low. So this is where the rift is, and this is where the eruptions happen. Next, Let's have a look at another set of experiments. So below, this was carried out by Bertelsen et al. just this year. So they've also decided, yes, we do like your gelatin experiments. We'll try to run it too. So we can see here that they too have had the same results where they have a fissure eruption and flanking that fissure eruption, we have two regions of topographic high let me just change my pen, two regions of topographic high flanking this region of topographic low. So it is very, very good, very promising to see that a lot of people are getting the same results from our experiments. And these compare directly to the Okada model. So this is a numerical model. So this is a theoretical model from 85. And again, it does show this pattern of two topographic highs flanking a region of topographic low. So to see all of these experiments come together and have the same results is very promising in terms of trying to constrain the volcanic processes around intrusions such as dikes. So yeah, very interesting results. So just to bring everything back together, so we know that we definitely have excellent remote sensing and measurements of ground deformation, we can now include the methods of using analog and numerical modeling to be applied to different experiments. And this can be different analog materials, and we can also study different intrusion geometries. And because these methods are so rigorously tested, and the fact that they match really well with theoretical models and also models from nature, that means we're even closer to developing a pattern recognition model that can definitely help to improve the interpretation of ground deformation in volcanic regions. So with better interpretation means there is better hazard mitigation. So this in turn will save a lot of lives of people living around volcanic areas. So if you are interested in making your very own jelly volcanoes, then this is a fact sheet that I made for the University of Liverpool. So a lot of schools have gotten in touch with us to make their own jelly volcanoes in their labs. So we have two sheets, one for undergraduates and postgraduates and another for high school or secondary school students. So if you are interested, feel free to scan the code. I can send this to you later as well. And this was made by me. All the illustrations are my own as well. 
So if you don't want to read through the fact sheet, what you need to know about making your own jelly volcanoes is the basic setup. So the things that you will need is a jelly of some sort. So you can either use gelatin or here in Malaysia, we can use aga aga. And then you will need a syringe with a needle. So this is to create a fracture for your intrusion to grow into. So this one here is commonly used in jelly art. You can get this from Mr. DIY. It's a set of needles with different fracture patterns to make your leaves and flowers. Okay, so this is not sponsored. And then you can also have your own types of magma. So you can have dyed water, you can have syrup, you can have chocolate. So play around with the viscosities. What if you have a really thick magma or if you have a really runny magma, what will happen? Okay, so you can give this a try yourself and create your own fluid filled fractures at home. Okay, so just looking at the time, I think we do have a few more minutes to go over the sill experiments. So I'm just going to show you them really quickly. So here is what the sill experiments look like. So as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, the sill experiments consist of two layers of gelatin with different concentrations. So in this case, we had the experiment with a three weight percent top and a two weight percent bottom. So this means we can measure the Young's modulus off the top and infer the Young's modulus off the bottom layer using the time at which the jelly has been left to set. So this is just to show you what a sill would look like. So it will exploit that interface between the two layers of gelatin forming a sill. Okay, so this is just to show you what that looks like. And here are the results from the surface deformation scan. And because of the different orientation in which the sill grows, the patterns are not as prominently picked up as the ones that we've seen on the dikes. So we can see that in general though, there will be a region of uplift above where the sill is growing. So as you can see here, even as we put all the slices together, the pattern is not that clear. You can't really tell which part of it is the sill. You can kind of make up this part here where you can say that, oh, the sill is growing to the right. But even that is quite a little bit of a stretch. So to make this better, hopefully in the future, there will be a way to scan it in a plane instead of a line which was good for the dike, but not as good for the sill. Okay, so that was the surface deformation. So now let's have a look a little bit at the vertical displacement as seen through the gelatin. So yes, we confirmed that there is definitely surface deformation as the dike is propagating up and as it hits the interface, the whole surface is lifted. And as, this, as the sill moves towards the side, you can see that the bulge is more prominent above where the sill is growing. So that is promising. So we know that there is uplift, just that the pattern is not as prominent as you would see in dikes. And to tie that all back into the models from literature, let's go back to the Okada model. So again, the results from our dike and sill experiments match this really well. So for the Okada vertical and horizontal tensile cracks models, we can see here that above the dike, we do have that V shape. So we have the two regions of topographic high flanking a topographic low and above sills, we do have that regional uplift right above it. So very reassuring to know that the patterns do match to the theoretical models, but yes, we still hope to see better results with the surface deformation in the lab with gelatin for cells. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of the presentation. So let's just have a few closing remarks and then I will open the floor for questions. So at the beginning of the talk, I did mention that there is an increasing 
interest in analog models, especially in volcanology. So I would just like to bring you here to this slide where I show you the evolution of analog models and where my models fit in. So my model is here. This is our publication G. So this was our publication in 2018 where we had the three different setups. So one of the setups I did not mention is that we have fluorescent particles in the growing intrusion as well. So that was my contribution, but you can see that analog models are continuing to evolve over time. So we've gone from the Hubbard and Willis model in 57, which used plaster of Paris, all the way to Pop et al's models, which use CAT scans to model these intrusions in 3D in real time. So you can see how the models are becoming more and more complex and better. So I look forward to seeing more analog models in the future, and I'm excited to see what comes next. So I hope as a takeaway from this talk that I've gotten people excited to learn more about volcanology because volcanology is an absolutely fascinating subject. So it's pictures like these, like this picture from the most recent Iceland volcano eruption that drew me to volcanology in the first place as a young child. So volcanoes are fascinating and also deadly and they make for such interesting research topics. So not just volcanoes here on Earth, there are also volcanoes in space. So this black and white photo you see here is a photograph of Olympus Mons, which is on Mars. So space geology is something that is really exciting at the moment and I wish I could get into, but unfortunately I don't think I have the funding or the opportunities yet, but if the opportunity arises, then yes, I will definitely jump onto the space volcanology wagon. So here, Olympus Mons, you can see here that it is bigger than Mount Everest and it's even bigger than Mauna Kea. So something very exciting, something that I love reading up on. And then here on the right, just in case you don't like the volcanoes here on Earth and you don't like the volcanoes in space, you can also check out volcanoes in popular science and in popular games. So this paper here that I've included on this slide, this looks at volcanoes in popular video games. So this was inspired by one of the Fortnite maps, I believe where they had a volcano and the authors had a look at volcanoes in other popular games as well. So yes, there is a lot to look at in volcanology. So I really do hope that I've gotten more people excited about going into volcanology or starting up on volcanology because at the moment, I don't know many volcanologists here in Malaysia, and it's often brushed down to being to saying things like, oh, we don't have any volcanoes, so we don't need any volcanologists. But then again, the UK, where I did my PhD, the UK is also very, very clean of volcanoes, so no volcanoes here. But the UK has one of the biggest volcanic and magmatic studies group and it has over a thousand subscribers and over 200 conference attendees each year. And our nearest neighbor, so the Earth Observatory of Singapore, they also have a pretty good volcanology program, which involves a lot of outreach and also working alongside scientists from Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, and worldwide on volcanology. So I hope I get more people excited about volcanology because we can definitely use with a few volcano experts of our own that are homegrown and ready to serve the people of the world. And that brings us to the end of today's session. So thank you very much everyone for coming to my talk. And I would like to thank UKM for the opportunity to share my research with everyone and for giving me the opportunity to carry out that research with the Magma Lab in 
Liverpool. So once again, thank you everyone. And if you're interested in some extra reading, if you want to read up a little more on the topic, so you can access my thesis here. And also you can read more about volcanic and igneous plumbing systems here. And with that, I thank you for your time and I would like to open the floor for questions or comments.